Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, I'd like to welcome you to a webinar where Professor Shai Arkin will be talking about COVID-19 and the future of immunotherapy. So this is a webinar that's a partnership between Beth Tikva and Canadian Friends of Hebrew University. So welcome. I'd first of all like to thank Merle Goldman, who is a longtime member of Beth Tikva and of Canadian Friends of Hebrew University and Sigal for initiating this and organizing it. I'd also like to welcome Joanne Goldman, who is an alum of Hebrew University, as well as a Beth Tikva member, and her husband, Roy, who will be moderating this afternoon. So I will pass it over to Joanne, who will be introducing Professor Arkin. Sorry, hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Arkin. Professor Arkin is the Arthur Ledgewa Professor of Structural Biochemistry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the former Vice President for Research and Development at the University. He heads a team of researchers who investigate the structural biology of membrane proteins in important human pathogens. Since these proteins are essential elements of the virus, they present an important target for medicinal drug research. Professor Arkin's research has succeeded in shedding new light on the inner workings of the flu virus, and in particular, how the virus avoids antiviral therapy. His integrative and multidisciplinary approaches are dominant in his work, and his fruitful interaction with biology, chemistry, physics, and medicine has enabled great strides in advancing the understanding of proteins and related fields. Professor Arkin has studied at the Faculty of Agriculture at the Hebrew University in the Faculty of Life Sciences at Tel Aviv University, and he received his doctorate in cell biology from Yale University. He is the recipient of an Alon Fellowship, the Klaschke Prize for the Advancement of the Frontiers of Science, and an Award for Excellence in Teaching. Professor Arkin, we are excited to have you to share with us your research and insights. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Hopefully my talk will be slightly longer than that. Uh, uh, but uh, I guess I need to say uh, good afternoon to you here. It's good evening in Jerusalem. And what I'd like to do is to uh, welcome you to my house because that's where I am right now. And to tell you a bit about uh, the area, the field that we're all very concerned about right now, which is obviously COVID-19, viruses, et cetera. And for that, what I will do is I will prepare, I have prepared a uh, presentation that I may share with you. Okay, excellent. Can, uh, can you see my uh, presentation? If anyone is still unmuted. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So there we are. So first of all, what's on, on the agenda today? So I'm gonna start with a short disclaimer. And uh, then what I'd like to do, as opposed to just telling you exactly, you know, uh, try to answer the inevitable question, when will this all end? When is the vaccine coming? When will we get antiviral therapy, et cetera? And I'd like to provide you with a bit more of, of a background in order for us to slightly understand better all the information that we are constantly being inundated with. So I'd like to talk a bit about what our virus is really. Let's start from ground zero here and uh, to say a few words about them. How are they distinguished from bacteria? How do we combat viruses? How do we fight viruses? Why are they so devious? Why do they develop resistance continuously? And then we will get to the topic at hand, which is obviously coronaviruses. Now, where do they come from? Uh, why uh, did they hit us? What are they in the first place? What are the major challenges and prospects that we face? And obviously, I will be remiss if I won't mention some of the exciting work that we are doing at the Hebrew University on COVID-19. And HUJI stands for the Hebrew University Jerusalem Israel. And after that, I will be more than happy to take some uh, uh, questions. Okay, so on with the topic. As I said, first of all, a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not a physician, I'm not a doctor, nor am I an epidemiologist. In fact, I might not even be considered a true virologist. What I am is a biochemist and I study the inner workings of viruses. And as I somewhat cynically remark, 
up until December 2019, all of the information that I have amassed was viewed by the vast majority of people in the world as esoteric and irrelevant. And as of December 2019, it would seem that I'm in the thick of things. So it's quite exciting. And I'm excited to be able to share this sort of information with friends of the Hebrew University or anyone around the world for that matter, which is what I'm doing tonight in Westmont, Quebec, I imagine. Alrighty, so let's start really from ground zero, what are viruses? And as opposed to the numerous uh, highly educated people that you tend to see on television today, I will try to describe that in English. And that is, you know, words with no more than two to three syllables at most. So let's start from the obvious, viruses are tiny. They're really, 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 really small. But, you know, uh, a needle, the head of a needle is also small. A grain of sand is, is small. Viruses are small as well as our bacteria. How small are viruses? So this is a very good perspective. So if you look on the right, and I take it that we are in Canada, so one talks about meters and not feet, which is convenient for me. So if we look on the right, you see a human uh, anywhere between uh, one and a half to two meters in size. And if you start going to the left, you will see, you know, a chicken egg is smaller. The smallest cell in our body is probably something that if you were to take your two fingers and try to approach them as much as you can before they touch, that's probably the size of that cell. So below one millimeter, as you can see, a human egg is, uh, let's say, a tenth of a millimeter. Our standard animal cells on the left, you know, those constitute all of our body. We're composed of cells, is about a tenth of that. Bacteria, as you can see, that strange looking thing uh, in green is about one micron in size. So, micron is a millionth of a meter. So, if you take one million bacteria, put them one after the other, you will get something that's about approximately this big but that's still significantly larger than viruses. So viruses are much smaller than that. As you can see, the flu virus is about, is, is less than 100 nanometers. So it's about 20th, if not 30th of a bacteria. So we, you would need to put about 30 million flu viruses, and a coronavirus is roughly the same size, 30 million viruses, one after the other, in order to get to a meter. In terms of volume, obviously, that multiplies to the power of three. So you can put millions of viruses within each one of our animal cells, and that's quite amazing. Okay, so obviously, how do we view viruses? Well, what I've done here is I've blackened out everything that cannot be seen with a naked human eye. Okay, so we can't view our cells except irregular gigantic cells like human eggs. And obviously we can't see bacteria and obviously we can't see viruses with a naked eye. Well, how about a regular light microscope? Well, still you probably cannot see viruses there. You can see some bacteria with a top light microscope. And in order to see viruses, what you would require is an electron microscope. Those big sophisticated machines that were invented in the uh, middle of the previous century. So that's how we view viruses, and that's how some of these pictures that you're being familiar with uh, came about. Okay, I thought about providing you another demonstration of how tiny a virus is by way of ratio. So we're all probably familiar that the largest object around us is the sun. Okay, the ratio between a human and the sun in terms of volume is roughly the same ratio between a human and a virus. So hopefully that uh, sort of brings home the notion that viruses are very small. Now, some of you might say, as the question on the bottom states, can a mask really prevent infectivity if viruses are so small? Are the holes in my mask so tiny to prevent viruses going through? Well, the answer is obviously they're not. The holes are bigger than a virus, but fear not because viruses are carried in the air in tiny water droplets, which when we cough or we speak out loud, etc. So don't worry, that's what masks normally prevent. They prevent the penetration of a water droplet. And the World Health Organization has indeed 
uh, repeatedly shown that masks are very, very effective to preventing infectivity. So what are viruses after we've determined their size? Well, at the end of the day, they are genetic parasites and they act as infectious agents. What does that mean? They enter your body and they basically utilize, they commandeer all of your resources in order to make more of themselves. Okay, so they view us as their assembly line, as their factory, and their objective is simply to replicate. Now, unfortunately, sometimes the fact that they commandeer all of our resources results in the fact that we are depleted. And often, which is perhaps what takes place in some of the COVID-19 disease, is that our immune system overreacts and actually causes more damage than the virus does, okay? So what you can see here is the infectivity cycle of a generic virus, okay? One thing that we must appreciate that viruses are amazingly diverse. So if you would have thought, well, I have an antibiotic that fights bacteria. I, I don't necessarily know precisely which kind of bacteria, but it is a broad range antibiotic. Would we expect to have a broad range antiviral agent? And the answer is no, simply because viruses are amazingly diverse. They infect practically every single thing that we are familiar with. There are viruses that attack bacteria. On the bottom right, they're called bacteriophages. There are viruses that attack plants. This is a tobacco mosaic viruses, causes this mosaicity pattern on tobacco. And obviously there are plenty of viruses that attack humans and lots of other animals that we're familiar with. Not only that, if we just concentrate the discussion on viruses that attack humans, look at their pictures. Now, obviously this is not an electron microscope, but this is something quite similar to that and they are dramatically different. In fact, I think it's fair to say that one virus is more different than the other than we are from bacteria, believe it or not, okay? We share more genes with bacteria than viruses uh, from one another. And just uh, to give you further perspective, that's hepatitis B virus and that's the Ebola virus drawn to scale from one another. So again, these are dramatically different entities. One thing that we need to remember is viruses are also incredibly simple. Uh, just to give you a perspective, the number of genes, genes are the instructions that our body uses in order to make proteins. Uh, we have anywhere between, uh, initially we thought that we had something like 20 some odd thousand genes, but they can be used differently. In scientific lingo, we call that splicing, alternative splicing. So we have more than 50,000 genes. On the bottom right, you can see a uh, bacteria, the famous coli bacteria. They have about 4,400 genes. A small virus such as influenza, coronavirus, etc., normally has about a dozen, perhaps two dozen genes. That's it. So these are really tiny, very simple machines. Now, one thing that I've intentionally tried to avoid is to misspeak and to say this is the life cycle of the virus, this is how viruses live, etc. Because there's a big argument, it's mostly a philo philosophical one, are viruses alive? Well, uh, that really depends on what you classify uh, as their requirements for being a living creature. So for example, viruses do not grow as opposed to us, we all recall that when babies are born, they're rather small and they grow with size. Viruses, the second that they are finished being manufacturers, that's it. They don't grow anymore. Obviously, they reproduce, but they don't reproduce the way that we do. Our cells divide in order to make more cells. So one cell divides into two, two cells divide into four, four cells divide into eight, and vice versa. Viruses don't uh, replicate in that way. They are produced and on assembly line. Viruses do not undergo metabolism. They don't breathe, they don't ingest food and then secrete all the waste products. They don't do that at all. They don't maintain their internal surroundings. Homeostasis is what, how we call this, and again, scientific lingo. 
It's not clear if they respond to uh, stimuli. They do have an internal organization, as you'll see in a second, and they clearly evolve. So as you can see, they qualify for some of the criteria for being a living creature, but they do not qualify for some. So normally we don't classify them as living creatures. Quite often we tend to confuse viruses and bacteria, uh, and bacteria, excuse me, uh, both very important infectious agents, two classes of pathogens. And it's important to realize that both of them cause us dramatic harms. Well, bacteria are obviously living organisms. If you recall the previous table with all the living characteristics, bacteria qualify for each and every one of them. Viruses, on the other hand, are simple genetic entities. Okay? Diseases. Well, bacteria also have their fair share of dreadful diseases. If it's plague, tuberculosis, cholera, anthrax, Lyme disease, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, up until the strep throat, for which we take antibiotics every winter. Okay, viruses, on the other hand, cause such diseases such as influenza, the common cold, hepatitis, AIDS, smallpox, and obviously COVID-19, which stands for, incidentally, coronavirus disease of 2019. How do we treat bacterial diseases? We give vaccinations, and we use antibiotics. Antibiotics are small chemicals that prevent the bacteria from replicating in our body. <clears throat> we have the same approach, believe it or not, for viruses as well. Vaccination is also very effective uh, to curb viral uh, infectivity. And we also have small chemicals that prevent viral diseases, antiviral drugs, okay? Now, what are the challenges? In the Western world, in all honesty, in the past few decades, bacteria have not been a dreadful problem. Obviously, it's still a problem, especially when we talk about resistance to antibiotics. But if you compare it to other diseases, which most people succumb to in the West, if it's heart disease, if it's Alzheimer, Parkinson's, et cetera, cancer, of course, <clears throat> which is the cause of the biggest uh, mortality, bacteria are not even remotely close to that. Prior to December of 2019, I might even classify viral diseases as something that does not threat man threaten mankind. Influenza, believe it or not, is the biggest killer. In the US alone, it, it results in the death of about 60,000 people every year. It's the most important infectious agent. But again, all of that has been turned upside down entirely with the emergence of COVID-19. The same cannot be said about the developing countries. Uh, there, some bacterial diseases are still resulting in catastrophic life loss. <clears throat> Things like dysentery, pneumonia, diarrhea, tuberculosis are a tremendous problem, okay? As are some viral diseases, most notably AIDS, okay? So finally, we get to the topic in hand, coronaviruses. And we all know that today we call coronaviruses because of those spikes that are located on its exterior. And uh, in terms of classification, normally viruses are classified with respect to their genetic information. What is it, is it composed of? And this is a very good example of the huge diversity of viruses. So all animal creatures on Earth utilize double-stranded DNA for their genetic information, okay? Double-stranded, I mean there are two strands of a very long molecule called DNA, and that forms our genetic information. It also forms the genetic information of our cats, our dogs, as well as bacteria that live in the sewage system in our gut. You see all of the animal kingdom obviously plants, et cetera, et cetera. Viruses can also have double-stranded DNA. It can have single-stranded, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, et cetera, et cetera. So just by the classification of what kind of genetic information does the virus have, we are able to distinguish it from other viruses, okay? So coronaviruses infect mammals and birds. In the livestock and poultry, coronaviruses are known to those people, for example, that uh, raise pigs. One of the most dreadful viral diseases in the animal kingdom is porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which is known, for example, every year 
It results in the culling of a huge number of pigs, namely in China. Transmissible gastroenteritis virus causes tremendous problems uh, to uh, cows, etc. When you rush to the vet with your cat because it has a cold, uh, a life-threatening cold for the cat, normally it's because of the coronavirus. But I would imagine that none of you heard the term coronavirus prior to 2000, December 2019. <clears throat> because prior to December 2019, other than two stints, which I'll talk about in a second, coronaviruses were really a minor nuisance. They caused respiratory, respiratory tract infections, which are mostly mild. So that's the sniffing and sniffing uh, that you commonly classify as the common cold. About a third of them are caused by coronaviruses. Two thirds are caused by another virus called rhinovirus. However, they are rogue members of the uh, coronavirus family. And uh, the first one that we are familiar with came about and uh, made its appearance in the winter of 2002-2003. And the uh, disease was called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And the virus was then called SARS coronavirus. Today, we call it SARS coronavirus 1 because today we also have a SARS coronavirus 2. The amount of deaths that it resulted was about 770 from close to eight, slightly more than 8,000 patients, meaning a mortality rate approaching 10%. In Canada, people were all too familiar with this because there was a single individual that boarded a plane in Southeast Asia, landed in, uh, landed, I believe it was in Toronto, if I'm not mistaken, and resulted in uh, sort of a minor scare. Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, made its debut in 2012. It's even more lethal. Uh, there were about 2,500 cases with a mortality rate of 34%. So you see both of these cousins of the current virus are actually deadlier, which believe it or not is probably one of the reasons that they didn't spread so much. Okay, let's say a few words about that later on. The current disease, as I said, coronavirus that, uh, disease of 2019, it's a causative agent, or again in scientific lingo, the etiological agent is today called SARS-CoV-2. Why? Because it's about 80% identical to the virus that caused the disease in 2002. It was so similar that in fact today we call it SARS-CoV-2, and that one was called SARS-CoV-1. Now, believe it or not, if the West would have paid attention to SARS from 2002, if it would have generated vaccines or any, any antiviral treatment, we would not be in the same position as we are today, okay? But because SARS of 2002 disappeared after a year, people said, well, what's the point of investing resources in studying a disease that has disappeared? So as of three days ago, there were about 16 some odd million people that were infected with the virus, at least confirmed cases, with about 644,000 deaths, which means that the mortality rate is about 4%. If you look at the mortality rate in the US, it's you know 3.5%. In Canada, it's a bit higher, 77 .7. In Israel, despite the fact that as of late, we have been experiencing a big resurgent, a second wave, if you will, still the mortality in Israel is very, very low, and there, there's probably a variety of reasons why that is the case. But again, all of these numbers are suspect. One should immediately conclude that, oh, we are doing worse, or we are doing better, because the classifications of uh, the mortality and the cases, etc., is inconsistent between different countries. For example, I don't know if you realize this, but the country that has led the world in mortality per capita, anyone care to guess? Believe it or not, it's Belgium. But because Belgium has been very, very lenient in classifying any death due to a respiratory disease as most likely coming from COVID-19. So again, it's difficult to compare country to country. Where did they come from? Well, I think it's pretty... Oh, Sorry, where did they come from? 
I think it's pretty obvious. We know where they came from. Uh, I don't uh, subscribe to any of these uh, conspiracy theories that this virus was an escapee from a uh, genetic engineering laboratory uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, and the reason for that is quite simple. The current virus is in fact 90 some odd percent identical to viruses that were found to infect other species, namely bats. So crossing the species barrier is something quite common. Viruses very often have a natural reservoir, which very often is very difficult to identify. And then what happens every so often, they jump, they traverse the species barrier, and a disease like that is called a zoonotic disease, okay? And obviously consumption of wildlife animals increases the risk. Now, if you were to take a bat, which as you'll see in a second, and as you probably know, is uh, the natural reservoir as far as we know right now, and if you were to boil it dramatically, you would probably destroy the virus there. But if you were limiting yourself to eating animals that you raise by yourself and you can control their uh, habitat and what they eat, et cetera, I think you'd be uh, much safer. And again, perhaps as a vegetarian, one might say that if you limited yourself to not eating animals at all, you would reduce the risk as well. Okay, so SARS 2002-2003, it came, the initial reservoir is the Chinese horseshoe bat. Uh, a bat needs to be very light, so what it does is it eats fruit, but it only wants the sweet nectar of the fruit, so what it does is it throws on the ground the fiber. Guess what that does? That serves as wonderful food for the Himalayan palm civet, and for reasons that are only clear to the good people of Southeast Asia, they decide to eat the Himalayan palm civet and therefore contract uh, the virus. MERS is thought to have arisen in a similar process where once again, the reservoir was a bat. In this instance, the Egyptian tomb bat, how the viruses were uh, transmitted to the uh, camel is not really known. And there the camel in uh, uh, the Arabian Peninsula served as the intermediary um, transport vehicle for the viruses. Currently, I think we realize that it's a bat, it's the a reservoir. The bat might transmit the virus to a pangolin. There have been clear cases of wild pangolin that uh, have the virus in their uh, bloodstream. And again, uh, in, uh, South, in, in Eastern Asia, it is a uh, common practice to eat such exotic animal, uh, animals such as the pangolin and to contract viruses in that process. So COVID-19, this is a uh, picture of a few days ago. This is a very good resource that I would recommend you to have a look at from Johns Hopkins University. As you can see, the number of cases around the world, it's very difficult to find areas in the world without red spots on them. As you can see, America, uh, the US is the world leader with about more than 4 million cases and close to 150,000 deaths. Brazil is following after that, etc. And what you see on the bottom right are the confirmed cases. And as you can see, these are dramatically substantial. We recognize that this is a very cruel disease with respect to the elderly. And a good number to keep in the back of your mind is that roughly, very, very roughly, mortality doubles every decade. So if you're between 30 and 40, your chances of not dying from the disease are twice as good if you were between 40 to 50. Between 40 to 50, you're doing about two times two better than the age group above you and so on and so on. But again, if we look, if you're above 70 years old or above 80 years old, your chances of incurring severe mortality, morbidity from this disease are quite dramatic, which has led people to talk about the unconscionable uh, emphasis that many have raised about how can we reach herd immunity? And I'll say a few words about that later on. 
Okay. Interestingly, uh, it, men are more susceptible to COVID-19 uh, than women are. It's not that clear why that is the case. There are a few ideas, but as at the end of the day, if you were an elderly man, your chances of succumbing to this disease are quite high as opposed to a young female, for example. Now, how do we combat viruses? What do we do in order to eradicate a disease like that, or at least mitigate its effect? And there are normally three approaches. On the left is the most common one, vaccination. I'll say a few words about that, obviously. There's also drug therapy. And on the bottom right, there is another mechanism uh, that people have used, and that's anti-sera, or another term, which again, scientific lingo, excuse me, convalescent therapy. At the end of the day, what this involves is taking antibodies from someone that has recovered from the disease and giving those antibodies to someone that is currently enduring the disease. Now, the only slight problem with this approach, which has proven to be incredibly useful for us to combat snake venom and other dreadful things like that, is there's been a big study in China about the applicability of convalescent therapy. And unfortunately, the study there showed no advantage whatsoever. So, so far, despite the fact that this has potential, it hasn't uh, shown to provide any benefit whatsoever. So before we talk a bit more about how to combat these, we need to keep in the back of our mind viral resistance. For example, you might say, wait a minute, I got a polio vaccination when I was very uh, young. I don't need a polio vaccination throughout my life. Why is it that I need a new flu shot every year? What's happening there, okay? And the reason is that viruses have a different evolutionary strategy than we do. We make one incredibly sophisticated creature, organism, okay? Incredibly sophisticated with 50, 60,000 different machines within us, different proteins, okay? And we really cherish our genetic information and we go to great length in order to ensure that we pass on our genetic information as precisely as we can. And we can actually put a number of that. So we make a mistake, which in science we call it a mutation, every 100 million letters in our genetic code, okay? Every 100 million time, every 100 million letters, when we replicate ourselves, we will make a mistake. Some viruses make a mistake every 100 letters. So simply spoken, viral proteins, the machines that enable viruses to work, evolve up to a million times faster than our proteins. And if the target of your therapy, be it antibodies or an antiviral agent, is now targeting something that has changed, it is no longer effective. It is no longer efficacious, okay? And that's why a viral resistant is something to keep in the back of our minds. Okay, so current efforts uh, to cure the virus. So vaccine development right now is progressing, I wouldn't even say faster than we could imagine because we could never imagine something as fast as this. Uh, there are about 100 trials around the world currently developing vaccines. Uh, you probably heard about uh, companies such as Moderna from uh, uh, the Boston area, I believe, and uh, AstraZeneca working together with Oxford University. Oxford University is doing a standard vaccine, if you will. So the way that your body responds to a vaccine is you inject either a dead virus or an attenuated virus or weakened virus or parts of the virus in your body. And then you develop an immune response. You develop antibodies against that foreign agent, which we tend to call antigens. Moderna is using an entirely new approach, which incidentally has never resulted in a single vaccine, but again, is incredibly promising. What they're doing is not injecting you with a foreign uh, 
entity, the antigen, they're actually injecting you with genetic information that tells you to make the foreign uh, antigen. So that's quite exciting. And there have been some very, very recent reports in the New England Journal of Medicine of successful results in primates. So I think it's probably safe to say that a vaccine will uh, come. But the obvious question that everyone has in the back of our minds is when. So few months is probably unrealistic. A year is probably not entirely unrealistic, a year of today. Now, one thing that is exciting is we need to remember how vaccine development progresses. So if you are a company that's generating vaccines, you undergo trials in order to see safety. And you need to remember that vaccines are given to healthy people. So the threshold for side effects is very, very high, or at least lack of side effects, excuse me. And once you're finished with all the tests, then you start production. Well, what has happened around the world is that governments have basically told these companies, look, don't wait. We are willing to put a bet. We are willing to wage a lot of money. So they're giving already lots of companies around the world large sums of money to start production, even though it's not clear that all of those will actually produce a viable vaccine. But the last thing that you want is for someone to undergo tests for, let's say, half a year, then to realize, okay, it works. Let's start making it. Well, that's going to take another six months. Okay, so that's a good development. So some good news. Uh, first of all, the virus does not seem to be changing so much as opposed to influenza. So it does a better job replicating its genetic information. So it's probably a good a, a estimation that vaccine will be effective. And it's also true to say that there are vaccines against animal coronavirus. Do you remember that virus with the dreadful name, porcine epidemic diarrhea virus? Those that raise pigs have known about anti-coronavirus vaccines for a long time. Slightly bad news, uh, antibody numbers, so the results to a vaccine, those that have, uh, people that have undergone the disease and recovered from it, the numbers seem to drop with time dramatically. So there have even been people out there uh, that have recovered from the disease and after three, four months, we can barely see antibodies. Now in the report in the New England Journal of Medicine, by Moderna, in which primates were vaccinated and then were able to withstand the disease, that was great. But what we didn't do is let's wait for eight, nine months and let's give them the virus after that. And again, we need to keep in the back of our minds, and this is very pessimistic and probably unrealistic for coronaviruses, that there are some viruses out there that despite our very best efforts, we were never able to get vaccines against. So. HIV, hepatitis C virus, those are notable examples for viruses that we never had, uh, we were never able to get vaccines for. What about drug development? Well, we all know that drug development takes a really, really long time. And here you're talking, I wouldn't even say years, I would say minimum from one decade to, an, uh, to more. <clears throat> but one option that's very uh, promising is drug repurposing. So drug repurposing is taking a drug against one disease and showing that it's effective against another. And that actually can bypass a lot of the regulatory loops that you need to jump through uh, because you've already seen what the toxic side effects are. And right now there are several good drugs uh, that are being used. Uh, remdesivir is one example. Uh, dexamethasone is another. It's quite actually interesting because those two drugs work completely different. Remdesivir actually targets the viral machine that causes it to replicate its genetic information. It was originally designed for Ebola and actually did not get approval for Ebola, but it turns out that it is able to mitigate some very severe cases of uh, COVID-19. Dexamethasone, on the other hand, does something completely different. It doesn't attack the virus at all. Was it, what it does is it causes our immune system to relax a bit. When our immune system goes entirely haywire, or as in slightly less scientific terms says, goes berserk, 
we, it can cause more damage than actually the inflicting pathogen. So what we can do there is with a simple corticosteroids, subdue our immune system, and dexamethasone does a good job of that. Uh, there have been several huge trials uh, to find new uh, repurposed drugs. A few of those have just recently been completed, and my group is also trying to uh, do that sort of work as well, but in a smaller, uh, how shall I say that, Israeli scale. Okay, so what are we doing at the Hebrew University? The amazing thing is that about 10% of our faculty are concentrating on COVID-19. And what I'm going to do here is provide you with a teaser. I'm going to really go very briefly through this because instead of actually telling you at great length, what I want you to do is I want you to contact the Canadian Friends of the Hebrew University, and I want you to contact Dina and all the rest of the fantastic team there to get further information because, again, incredibly exciting stuff is taking place right now with the Hebrew University. So we have people from <clears throat> the uh, computer science department that are undertaking dramatic revolution to our ability to detect uh, viruses based on deep sequencing. So think about this. If we could do a screen, a test for COVID-19 for every individual on the face of the planet every single day, we would be able to eliminate this disease because we would simply tell all those that have the disease that are harboring the virus and are asymptomatic. They don't recognize that. We would simply be able to tell them stay at home. Okay, so increasing the capacity for detection is incredibly important and work that is being done by Nir Friedman and Nomi Habib is incredibly exciting. Work that's being done in our medical faculty, what we share with the Hadassah Medical Organization, that's the picture over there in Kalim, is breaking new grounds with animal models. So Leo Nisim and his colleagues uh, are developing uh, mice that actually are able to contract the same virus that you and I can actually contract, the same SARS-CoV-2. And the way that he was able to do that, he engineered mice to express the receptor, the element in the, that the virus recognizes and enables it to penetrate us. As I said, drug repurposing, we're doing a lot of work. And you might have heard about some exciting work that was done by Professor Yaakov Nachmias, Kobe as we call him. Kobe is collaborating with some uh, brilliant scientists in Mount Sinai in New York. And they were able to recognize the fact that in our lungs, the virus actually harnesses fatty tissue in our lung in order to propagate. And Kobe bring, being the brilliant scientist that he is, recognized, wait a minute, we can actually use a previous drug that was on the market that diminishes those fat reserves in our lungs and in doing so to deprive the virus from the mechanism that it can replicate. We're also doing a lot of work of attenuating the immune system. Uh, and as I said previously, the sort of things that dexamethasone is doing, but this is a very, very tricky business that requires a lot of expertise because don't forget, it's your immune system that's actually combating the virus. So you need to have a very simple, a precise balance of when you subdue your immune system because if you do it too early on, the virus will overtake you, but you want to ensure that your immune system does not run amok. And our uh, faculty of social sciences and social welfare are working day and night to understand the dramatic impact that the virus has on all of our lives, if it's from economy, if it's the result of social distancing, if it's the result of people not being able to see their parents and their grandparents for months on end, and all of the, and providing the social benefits and care to uh, those individuals. So this is really a, a broad and compassing problem that all of the tremendous capabilities that the Hebrew University are trying to address. So what are the challenges and open questions? And I think this is perhaps my penultimate slide. So one of the biggest questions out there, how many asymptomatic peoples are there out there? So one of the biggest differences between SARS of 2002, three, MERS and the current pandemic is believe it or not that the current virus 
is not as virulent. Yes, you heard me right. The current virus is less virulent than the virus that caused SARS in 2002. And the issue is that right now, someone can be asymptomatic for a few days, and in fact, for eternity, and not recognize the fact that he or she are actually transmitting the viruses to other people. Okay? As opposed to SARS of 2002 and clearly MERS, where within a short period of time, you develop such strong symptoms that you immediately recognize that something's wrong, and that enabled uh, people to quarantine you once you seek medical help. For how long are people contagious? <clears throat> I think we recognize probably that this is not months, this is probably a few weeks. A tremendous question that's really an open-ended, somewhat frightening question, does recovery confer long-term immunity? That is, do you have a get out of jail card the moment that you recovered from uh, COVID-19? The answer to that is, we don't know. There are clearly individuals out there with dramatically low antibody counts, uh, despite the fact that they actually recovered from the disease. Social distancing, how long can social distancing work? Well, first of all, we recognize social distancing works. It works amazingly well. But in all honesty, this is not a surprise. I mean, the virus is not Superman. It needs a vehicle to uh, transmit itself from one another. So if you lock everyone at home, you're not gonna be able to infect anyone or you won't be infected by anyone. So that's pretty obvious. Uh, but the problem with social distancing is that the second that you relieve social distancing, the moment that you open the floodgates, you'll, you'll see that you're gonna get a second wave. Now, Israel got this big time, but believe it or not, other countries are experiencing that on a daily basis. So the moment that the restrictions are relieved, we experience another round of infectivity. And the reason for that is due to the fact that social distancing works. So we've heard about the concept of herd immunity. <clears throat> herd immunity means that a significant proportion of the people in society are actually immune to the disease. Perhaps they develop antibodies to this disease because they were exposed to it. Well, right now, we know that their herd immunity, the number of people that develop antibodies is single digit less than 10% of the population. Why is that? Because we enacted social distancing. And there have been many people that says that even speaking about achieving herd immunity is unconscionable because of the graph that I showed you early on, what will that uh, mean to the elderly? So if 20% of people beyond 80 years old will die because of this disease, I don't really think that we can talk about attaining herd immunity. So when would it all end? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that we're gonna all wait for the uh, vaccine. I think it's gonna be a, a compendium of several different factors. I think that drug repurposing will offer good options. I think that vaccination will offer good options. But again, I would be surprised if this ends very soon. Uh, and by that, I mean, few months. It's probably still going to stick around with us, but I would be surprised if we are still encourage, incurring the wrath of COVID-19 within, let's say, a year or two. Okay, so if you're asking me to be a betting man, and as a scientist, I tend not to do that, I would say, you know, probably sometime early, mid-2021, but I can be dramatically wrong, okay? So that was actually not my penultimate slide. That was my uh, ultimate slide, my final slide. And now uh, I leave it up to you. I take it now there are uh, questions in the audience or I don't know who's going to be uh, 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 negotiating that or here I can stop sharing. Excellent. Okay. Hi, Shai. Uh, uh, it's uh, Roy here. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And uh, your ability to be able to uh, clearly um, explain sort of where we're at and uh, 
link it all the way to the end, which uh, the work that Hebrew U is doing is, is fascinating. And I, I look forward to what comes out of that. Um, for everybody who is on uh, the call right now, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, there is the opportunity, if anybody would like to type in some questions, uh, if you go to the Q&A option on your Zoom page, there is the option to type in questions and I'm happy to, uh, to share those. Uh, at least that should work. If not, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can figure out another way. Um, I had a couple of questions though, just to start us off. Uh, the first question was one that's much more practical. You mentioned the, um, the rapid testing, uh, the ability to be able to know who's got and who doesn't uh, within, within hours, almost point of care testing. How close are we? Uh, good question. I don't think it's going to be faster, but I think the volume will increase dramatically. So right now the testing is basically done to identify the genetic information of the virus. We call it PCR, polymerase chain reaction, etc. <clears throat> I think that how close are we? I would say once again, a few months, not closer than that, because while the while it works very well in laboratory settings, in the universities, et cetera, and research institute, to get the assurance of uh, the medical establishment, and I'm saying this actually positively, it's important because the last thing that you wanna do is to tell something, oh, you don't have the disease, and then the individual goes on uh, out and about and then infects lots of people. So I would say uh, a few months. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. One is, um, I don't know if you're able to see them, but I'll, I'll read them out. Yes, yeah. Okay, so there's a question about uh, the concept of multiple drugs being used to treat a, uh, an infection like HIV. Uh, are there, is, is there a possibility of a vaccine type of cocktail that's uh, sort of approaching it? Sure, that's what, you, that's what you have every year for influenza. So every year in influenza, you, if people need to... Uh, predict ahead of time what will be the major uh, circulating strains and you can generate a vaccine composed of uh, several of them together. So basically in influenza, what it means is that instead of injecting you with one kind of attenuated virus, we inject you with several kinds of attenuated viruses and it's your job to develop antibodies against them. So the short answer is yes, no problem whatsoever. Uh, next question we have uh, from Bruce Elman is, why is there such a uh, difference in mortality rates? And that's, that's obviously a loaded question. Uh, uh, okay, so here, you know, uh, coming from Israel, uh, uh, you know, I feel quite good about my own country. It probably has to do, again, the first thing is we need to remember that the metrics are not the same. The classifications are not the same. So the way that one country counts a death due to corona versus another may not be the same. <clears throat> I think a level of care, socialized medicine, uh, countries that are used to uh, dealing with extreme situations, a strong social networks within the country, etc. Uh, Israel excels in all of those. So I think that's one of the major reasons why Israel has done so well. In all honesty, do I trust the numbers that come out of, uh, uh, let's say, Russia? Uh, the short answer is no. Okay, so I wouldn't put too much emphasis in comparing uh, the numbers between one country or the next. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, what kind, kind of medication? medication? Yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you read it. The, the, the research you were talking about, I think they were talking about fetofibrates. Uh, was that was, that was the research yeah. you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of uh, medication you use for producing fat in the lung from uh, COVID-19? Well, what I'm going to do now, and again, I'm going to tell you people, talk to Dina. Dina is the long arm of the Hebrew University. The Canadian Friends of the Hebrew University enable us to conduct the wonderful work that we are doing. And I'm going to purposefully not tell you the name of the medication uh, other than the fact that obviously you can find it in Google in a second by Professor Yaakov Nachmias, but I really implore you to learn about that and the other wonderful work that we are doing at the Hebrew University. So, so that's going to segue right into question five here, which is, is any lab in Hebrew you working on a vaccine? Uh, the, answer, uh, the answer is no. For a reason that uh, a vaccine development is 
I would say outside of the realms of uh, academic research, it's more of uh, in the business of production. We, people know how to do this uh, and there's really not a lot of research uh, it, it taking place. I mean, I know that Oxford University is working with that, but they're really only doing some part of the development. Most of it is by the pharmaceutical giant uh, AstraZeneca. So it's vaccines are not normally develop. And again, there's nothing that special about this particular virus, but don't forget, we've only known about it for a few months now. So uh, I don't suspect this to be a, a tremendous challenge of uh, immune therapy as was uh, HIV or hepatitis C. Ah, there was a question here. How common are false positives or negative in the testing? Oi, that's a uh, that's well, that's a good question, but I'm gonna I'm slightly fearful from providing you an answer that will slightly uh, terrify you. So normally, uh, how should I say this? The false positives are quite high. Uh, I'm sorry, the false, false negatives. negatives are quite high, and by that I mean we miss a fair bit of people that actually have tiny, tiny amounts of the virus. And that's why if you have encountered someone with a disease, you go to get tested, but you're still required to stay 14 days in isolation. Okay, which might sound a bit odd. Wait a minute, I've tested negatively. Why can't I go back to work? Why can't I intermingle with other people? Well, because I wouldn't, I don't like to use the term quite often, but uh, that percentage is, you know, dis dramatically distinct from zero. Let me put it that way. Okay. Uh, will your session be available to share? It was very informative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The short answer is obviously. Okay. And again, uh, it, it's the Canadian Friends of the Hebrew University that made this possible. Yes. Yeah, so I just... Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to jump in to answer that um, and just to say that, yes, everybody who registered, whether or not they attended, will be receiving um, a, a copy of the recording and it will be available on the show website as well. Okay, so uh, uh, Miriam, Miriam McClintock, uh, that's a formidable name, uh, as anyone who's interested in genetics might probably recognize, Barbara McClintock, Nobel Prize uh, winner. Why not every patient that recovers from COVID-19 produces antibodies to the disease? Um, they probably produce antibodies, but the amount of those antibodies decreases with time. Why? We don't necessarily know. We even know that coronaviruses that cause the common cold, the amount of those antibodies decrease with time. So that's why we get the common cold every other year or so. But again, common cold is not a big thing. We don't necessarily know, and that's slightly terrifying. But again, fear not. The amount of effort that is taking place in order to ensure that if it's not a vaccine, it's going to be a drug. If it's not a drug, it's going to be this genetic vaccines, etc. You know, science will undoubtedly conquer this. So uh, I'll, I'll ask a question, just because there's no more on there. Um, is this the beginning of a new era? Are we going to be seeing more and more of these zoonotic type viruses uh, transmitting to, to humans and, or is this just a blip? <laughs> of course, I don't expect you to have the, the exact answer, but just your thoughts. Well, obviously the answer is 42, right? But <laughs> uh, I, would, uh, I, I would quote another, uh, you know, by way of levity, one of my great scientific heroes, Niels Bohr, that says that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. But now seriously, I think the globalization, uh, uh, the uh, human crowding, uh, all those are very conducive to this sort of thing happening. And I got to say, we were caught off guard. I mean, we had a mock trial. We had a trial run in 2002 that the uh, West ignored. And again, in November of 2019, if you were to ask Fritz in Hamburg, Francois in Paris, or John in, uh, in Toronto, are viruses a cause of concern? They would say, no. Yep. Uh, 
if you were to ask, you know, why is any little company that is doing cybersecurity worth 10 times the largest company in the world that produces vaccines, people say, well, because computer viruses pose a much bigger risk to us. So again, this is not me saying as someone that has been enamored by viruses from day one, you know, hey, I told you so, but this is, uh, this is a, a call to us to recognize the fact that, you know, we haven't beaten pathogens yet and uh, we need to pay attention. I'm not saying let's divert all the research funds, let's forget about Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or cancer, God forbid, no. But we should not, what we should not do is forget about viruses. And uh, on that note, I think we're at time. Uh, but I would like to thank you very much. As I said, it was an incredibly informative uh, session. Obviously, people are wanting to share with other people who weren't able to, uh, to be here, which is great. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Hebrew U, Beth Thikva, everyone else involved, uh, Merle, Joanne, um, for, for all the work on this. And uh, it was a great way to spend uh, this time today. So thank you that, and uh, thank you to everybody. Okay. Angela, is there anything last you want to say? Um, no, I think that's it. Thank you very, very much. I know it's getting later there. Um, we really, really appreciate your time. Thank you for all the attendees that came on. We're approximately 65 of you. So I think that's wonderful. Like we said, the recording will be made available to everybody and have a wonderful afternoon. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Shai. Okay, bye. -bye. Okay, bye.